great to have you on board. All right, so without any messing around, oh my goodness, so sort of not prepared that I haven't even got the preloaded questions loaded up. They're just appearing on another screen right now. All right, and in fact, we are going to answer a question which has been asked by two people. Uh, one is from Leo in Holland, and the same question was from Lucas. I don't know where Lucas is from. And the question is, how far from the top of the mast do you have the block for the spinnaker halyard on a Hobie 16? All right, so just to really clarify where we're measuring here. This is why I was a little bit late and unprepared because I was just measuring a, um, a uh, what you call it, spinnaker block on a Hobie 16. So this is the top of the mast. There's the roller bit that is on top. We're measuring from here to here. This is where the fitting would go, where your block is. And the distance that we've been waiting for is 48 centimetres. There we are. You heard it here first. So it is a bit closer to the top of the mast than you might expect. It's true. All right. So also tuning in live, we've got Chris in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Sounds like South Carolina is on board today. We've also got Thomas uh, tuning in from Germany. Nice to have you with us, Thomas. As always, uh, Thomas was just here in real life quite recently. All right. So first, uh, next, sorry, preloaded question. And this one comes from Mike. Um, he says, I've never flipped my boat while hiked out, uh, which I believe in this context means trapezing. I flipped my boat while sitting and it was easy to just abandon ship. Is there some advice on how to avoid getting hurt or damaging the boat um, when you capsize on the trapeze? I'm worried that the harness will stay hooked into the trapeze line uh, is that a rare occurrence or is it something that can be avoided? OK, this is a fine question. So. Am I going to draw something? Maybe not straight away. OK, so the two most common types of capsize that we would um, encounter as catamaran sailors or three most common, let's go for is one is sideways where we go over like that. One is forwards, the pitch pole, where we dig the nose in and we do a high speed dismount. And the third and um, very common on the lower volume catamarans uh, would be the backwards capsize, uh, like if you get washed off the back of the boat. Now, the good thing about being on the trapeze when you capsize is that you have some options um, of where to land and you can get a lot more distance away from the boat, which means you're less likely to hit something. So the first one, the sideways, um, how would I illustrate this? I really don't know. Um, the sideways capsize, if you're on the trapeze and you're going over sideways, when you get to the point of no return, when you know you are definitely coming off the boat, best thing to do there is um, to jump towards the back of the mainsail. That is going to um, get you clear of all of the harder parts of the boat. Basically, you want to end up further back than the shroud. If you're further forwards than the shroud, then uh, you're more likely to hit something that could uh, be uncomfortable, such as the forestay or the mast or landing in the jib 
would certainly be a pretty uncomfortable experience. So going towards the back of the mainsail is definitely preferential uh, if capsizing sideways. Um, if you are going to land in the sail, try to land flat. So when you're flying towards the sail, if you have got the time to turn and land on your back like a starfish, that is going to mean you're not putting as much kind of point load onto the sail and less likely to damage it. Um, but if you, the further you can get towards the back edge of the mainsail, the better. So that's the sideways. Um, and once you're in the water, uh, then you will have time just to unhook from the trapeze. And then it's also a good thing to be attached to the trapeze because it means you are attached to the boat. So if it's um, moving quickly in the water because it's windy, the trampoline on its side has got quite a lot of windage. Um, you've got the trapeze line. You can unhook from it and just hold it. And it means you're not separated from the boat. Bonus feature. Now, with the pitch pole, so if you dig the front of the boat in, then the best thing to do is if you know that you're definitely going and you can't stay anchored to the back of the boat, then you just want to boost gently away from the side of the boat. So if this is the hull, you're trapezing here. What I mean by boost gently, here's the rest of the boat, is just spring away from the back of the boat. So from the side of the boat. So you go this way just a little bit. And then by doing that, um, you're going to get that little bit of distance away from the side. So as the boat goes in, you're going to just be swung completely clear of any obstacles that you may hit. So that is a huge bonus um, if you are in the pitch pole on the trapeze club at that time. And then um, again, once you land in the water, having the trapeze with you is quite a good thing because with a pitch pole, you can end up quite a distance away from the boat. So having the trapeze with you means you've got that means of getting back towards the boat, especially if it's moving quickly. Then with the backwards capsize, you don't, if you've been on the trapeze, you don't really have a choice of where you're going to end up because usually you would just be in the water splashing around behind the boat and the boat would capsize very slowly towards you. But you shouldn't be too alarmed at that time. Once you're in the water, once you can, then unhook from the trapeze and um, again, use the trapeze to get back towards the boat. If you have capsized backwards, then hopefully you'd still be hanging on to the um, the main sheet uh, and you can use that to pull yourself back to the capsized boat. So there we go. Um, as soon as you're settled in the water, unhook from the trapeze, but hold on to it unless you're very confident that you can just swim back to the boat easy. OK, so I hope that helps, Mike. And uh, thank you very much for your question. All right, checking in with everybody who's checking in. We've got Scott dropping it in the slot. Nice to have you with us, Slot. We've got Russell as well. Um, thanks for the C2 video earlier this week. Hope to see more this summer. Oh, yes, I hope to be giving it some more beans on the C2 because the C2, and I dare say it goes for most modern F-18s, really does have a feel to it that is very nice indeed. It's very light on the helm, very manoeuvrable and downwind with the spinnaker up. You can push it really, really hard and the boat just keeps on giving. Great fun. OK, Scott says when writing the boat, so bringing back upright from a capsize, what is the ideal angle 
of mast into the wind to utilize the wind in assisting lifting the mast? It's a good question. I'd have to say at this point, if anybody who's what who watches the QA is a keen model maker, if anybody would like to make me a model, a model catamaran, like what would that be? Like the length of your forearm sort of length. What's that? 30 centimeters long uh, with a, a rudimentary rig on it. Then for this sort of thing, it would make it very easy to um, demonstrate. So if anybody would like to make me a model catamaran, get it in the post. Uh, your model catamaran could be in the next Q&A. You could even put your um, company's logo on the sale and get a bit of advertising out of it as well. How about that for a deal? Sounds good to me. But um, the ideal when we're capsized is for the wind to be blowing straight on to the front of the boat. Uh, there is a popular misconception that we want the wind blowing straight onto the top of the trampoline. But in fact, that's not going to help us as much. And you're more likely to flip over the other way. But um, if we look straight on to the capsized boat like this, and then there's the sail, um, by the wind coming straight on like this, the wind's going to blow the bit of the sail which is exposed. And then by it blowing that bit of the sail, it's going to get under that bit of sail. And we've got a bit of curve in the sail like this. So like an airplane wing, it's actually going to lift the mast up by the mast being straight into the wind. So the wind blowing in this direction, straight into the wind. And then once we've unstuck the top of the sail, then the boat is going to just flip upright pretty easily there. Um, yeah, so that is, uh, is that. There we are. All right, Nick says shrouds hurt big time. Yes, they do. So uh, yeah, try to avoid any rigging when going into a dynamic capsize scenario. All right, we've got Benny on board in Sweden. Great to hear from you, Benny. Hope it's all good uh, where you are. All right, we've got Jan Leo, uh, tornado sailor in Germany. He says, I picked up a wasp in the Netherlands last week in Holland. Uh, it's a lot more physical than tornado sailing. Should I bring it to Como for you to try? Yeah, why not? Um, yeah, because in the programme, of the tornado sailing, uh, there is a day in the middle of the event where um, I think a lot of the competitors will go on some sort of sightseeing tour. So I think to have something cool to do on the rest day would be a lot of fun. All right, Lee says, do they do have a 16, Hobie 16 model on the Tower Hobbies website? All right, I'll check that out. All right, clever. Oh, I can't, I can't make out what um what your name is there. Uh, there's, you're lacking in any vowels. But he says hello. Oh, it's Mike in Longboat Key, Florida. Nice to hear from you, Mike. Hobie sixteen is on the beach right now. Can downhauling the jib halyard damage the jib at the top eyelet? tour ours out sailing mainsail only for now oh right okay so yeah what we should have in in theory you should be able to pull the jib halyard as hard as you can on a hobie 16 so if this is the front of the jib What we've got inside the luff of the jib is a wire. Um, so we can pull that wire as tight as we want to. But the time when we might be risking damaging the sail 
is there'll be a small hole in the actual sail as well. And then the idea is from this small hole to the um, eye in the wire, we should have a thin line, like a bit of two mil, which this is not operating, um, which goes between there and there. And that is effectively the downhaul on the jib. So the jib halyard does our tension and then the small line so we can fix the one at the top so that it can't move. And then the one at the bottom, what we want to do when we're setting it up is to pull the rig tension on and then pull it this line tight enough so it takes all of the creases out of the sail, but not more. It's if you pull that super tight, then that is when you could risk damaging your sail. Or if you pull this tight when the jib isn't up on the boat because you don't know, uh, you basically don't know where you are unless the jib is actually rigged on the boat. So get your jib up first, then tension the small ropes at either end um, with the top already up, uh, of course, otherwise you won't be able to do that. And just pull it tight enough, take the creases out, and that way you shouldn't damage your sail. So if you damaged your sail by pulling the jib halyard, it would mean uh, these lines were too tight already. All right. So champagne conditions, by the way, in Vasiliki Bay uh, this whole week, last week as well. Um, so next from Leo in Holland. Leo shot me some pretty big questions. So here is first question from Leo. Why is it not useful in light winds to sail upwind on one hull? Yes. Yeah, so you may think that by getting the crew on the leeward side, So like the crew out on the, maybe even, oh, what am I doing? Out on the trapeze on the leeward side of the boat like this to encourage this hull to lift in light winds is going to be a really fast way of going, but it's not a fast way of sailing the boat. Why is it not fast in the light winds to do that? Yes. There is too much drag. What we're going to be doing is really loading this hull up, which is going to push that hull further down in the water. And with any hull profile, um, we don't want to be putting too much hull in the water. So the volume that we're losing from this hull is, going, is being used by this hull. That hull is going to be really deep in the water, creating more drag. What else? The mast is not going to be upright. So the mast is going to be however many degrees from being upright here, um, which means we're going to lose power from the rig. When the mast is dead upright, that is when we've got the most power in the rig when it's completely straight up. As it leans over, we're going to be losing power. And then the third reason why it's not so efficient to do this is like the mast not being upright, the foils, I'm going to exaggerate it a bit, are not going to be upright as well, which means we're not getting the same amount of lift and grip from the foils. So Again, it straight down is much better um, to get that sort of grip from the foils until we start sailing at um, a fair speed when they start really generating lift. So that is why we're not deliberately trying to fly the hull 
by perhaps trapezing on the leeward side in the light winds. There we go. So um, next one from Leo in his quiver of questions here. He says, in middle wind, so in a moderate wind, is it better to sail upwind in a straight line? Um, and the answer is yes, you really want to, in all wind strengths, be minimizing your steering. But what do you do when there is an area of more wind? Um, so as we get more wind in moderate winds, what we want to do is allow the hull to come out of the water. Once the hull is flying on the boat, we're going to go um, a lot quicker. If we've got both hulls in the water, you, this is kind of going against what we're doing in the light winds. But if it's the wind that's lifting the hull and we're in correct position on the boat, once we get the hull out of the water, then that is when the boat really starts to move. So if we, to start with, when we get a gust in moderate wind, let the hull lift. And then if the hull starts to lift higher than just clear of the water, then we want to allow the boat to turn up towards the wind, but not so much that it starts dropping, just so much that it doesn't lift anymore. This is going to be the optimal. And then if we get to that stage, um, we've turned up towards the wind. If we need to turn up towards the wind so much that the boat slows down, then that is when we want to either, if we're on a sophisticated boat, we want to pull the downhaul on more to flatten the sail, open up the leech. Or if we haven't got a sophisticated downhaul system, that is when we'd want to just loosen a little bit of main sheet as well. So we're using a combination of steering and either downhaul or main sheet um, to cope with the gusts there. All right. Next one. Is it better to have always a few centimetres of traveller out? Otherwise, you risk hooking the sail. Answer. No. Uh, in short, uh, what you'd want is to have the traveller central, but less main sheet. So we're putting more twist into the mainsail. If you're if having the main sheet and the traveller sheeted in tight is meaning that your telltales on your mainsail aren't flying, then it's better to ease the main sheet out so we get more twist. More twist is better for acceleration and it allows the sail to breathe more. So we're less likely to stall if we've got a bit more twist in the mainsail. Um, and also, if we let the traveller out, unless it is really, really blowing, then we're going to reduce our ability to sail close to the wind. OK, are we ready for the next one? Yes, let's go for the next one. Um, why is it not possible, this is an interesting question, to get the telltales in the mainsail streaming on the windward side when the wind is strong? And the same thing at the top of the jib. So the answer for this is because you can't physically hold down that amount of power when it's windy on an upwind course. Um, if you, uh, put some sort of, somehow, if you increase the amount of weight on your boat, which could be if you sailed with five people all on the trapeze, or perhaps you put a mega rack on your boat. So you trapeze, can you even see this? There's a guy on the trapeze out here. Um, loads of leverage to pin it down, then maybe you could keep the main sheet in enough to get those telltales flying. But what's going to happen, and this is the same story for the jib, is if you're trying to get those windward telltales flying, we're going to get into a vicious circle of apparent wind 
which stops us from sailing upwind. So what's going to happen is we're going to start sailing close to the wind like this. And then as we start going faster, the inside telltale on the jib is going to start lifting. If we then bear away to keep it flying, what's going to happen is we're going to start sailing even faster because we're now on a bit of a close reach. So as we start sailing even faster, our apparent wind is going to come more from the front. And that means the inside telltale is going to start lifting again, which means we have to start sailing even further away from the wind. So we're getting on for a beam reach here, half wind course. What's going to happen? We're going to go even faster. So the inside telltale is going to lift again. And before you know it, we're not going to be going anywhere near upwind because we're trying to feed the beast that is the windward telltales on the sail there. So that is why we can't have the inside telltales flying straight back in the strong wind. Mega. There we go. So continuing, why has a windsurf sail got a very loose leech? If you haven't seen a, a fair a windsurf sail, especially one that's made for speed from the last 20 years, if it's rigged correctly, when the sail is on the beach, the leech is actually so loose that there is no tension in it at all. And it is very, very loose. Like there's no tension in the back edge of the sail. Um, but you don't have this on a catamaran or a sailing boat generally. Now, the um, two reasons. When you see the windsurf sail on the beach, you're looking at it flat and not loaded up with power. Once the windsurf sail is upright and it's sheeted in, the bend of the mast does close the leech somewhat. It still fans outwards, but the leech is no longer loose. But the reason, the main reason why windsurfers can do it and we can't is because the windsurfer uses different sizes of sail for different wind conditions. Whereas we're stuck with our 17 square meters or whatever in any amount of wind, which means in light wind, we want to be able to get as much power as possible. And then in stronger winds, we can't downhaul it so much that it goes loose, um, uh, but we can downhaul it so it becomes flat and the leech will open, but not go super loose like on a windsurfer. The other thing is a windsurfing mast is much, much softer, hugely softer, meaning it bends more than the mast on a catamaran, which means that when we downhaul the sail, we can really bend the mast excessively and the leech of the sail becomes loose. So there we go. The last question from Leo in Holland is, he wants to buy a new spinnaker for his tornado. Um, now, he, would, he says, is the Grand Zagel spinnaker, this is the Swedish sail making brand, uh, it's got the logo of a Christmas tree. Are these the best spinnakers that you can get for a tornado? Now, um, the word on the street is they are the most competitive. But is that because the best sailors are using them or is it because of the sale? There's probably a bit of both in there. But they have got the Grand Zagel spinnakers have got the reputation of being the fastest spinnakers for the tornado. All right, final question from Leo. And I hope this is entertaining for ev everyone. I think these questions are very interesting, personally. Uh, last one, I want to buy the same speed watch as you, the LocoSys GW60. Now, 
Unfortunately, Locosis have stopped making the GW60 uh, GPS watch. This is a real shame because um, having used some other watches since, um, I do like the Locosis the most because it gives you the statistics, the breakdown, uh, which is very nice. I dare say there are some retailers around the world who still like some, um, I would try windsurfing shops as a good starting point um, to find one. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so unfortunately they're not being produced anymore by the manufacturer. It's a shame. Uh, in fact, that brings me quite neatly on to an announcement. On the 16th of July, that's not far away now, that's nine days away, we are going to be hosting for the first time ever at Wild Wind Sailing Holidays, Vasiliki, Greece, uh, the Festival of Speed, Speed Week. And for this Festival of Speed, we have stocked ourselves up with a, a quiver of Velocitech speed pucks. Yes, this is a really cool GPS. Um, I should have brought one with me for this, but I didn't. Um, they're big, they're round. This is almost actual size. And you can see, you can see the speed very easily as you go along. Um, very cool. And they only record the maximum speed over a period of 10 seconds. Now that is going to increase the accuracy of our speed competition. So we have got some availability um, for the 16th of July. So if you're at a loose end, perhaps if you're in Europe, um, a bit easier, I know, uh, to get to Greece and you don't know what to do and you like sailing fast, then um, check it out. Um, why not? Get yourself down to Wild Wind. I'll see you on the beach. Perhaps we even uh, go for a speed run together. There we go. 16th is when that is starting. Jolly good. If everybody could just, uh, if you've got a spare finger, if you could take the time just to hit the like button at this stage in the game, that would be very good. All right, where are we? Live chat. All right. So, yeah, thank you for the questions, Leo. And I hope the answers were to your liking. All right. We've got Hanny on board. Hello, Hanny. Uh, great to have you with us. If you can't be here with us, then you can be here with us on a Friday. All right. We've got Duke on board. Hello, Duke. I was sailing in a Hobie 16 race with high wind. My skipper insisted on pulling the jib as tight as possible upwind. This worked, but why? The rib was the jib was so tight, I thought that the rig would burst. All right. So the reason that having the jib super tight in heavy winds is because it flattens the sail. Uh, it's as that's all there is to it. By pulling the jib really tight, we change it from being a curve to a very flat sail, uh, which makes the boat, it takes the power out of sail somewhat, but also it makes the jib very effective and it directs the air very fast over the back of the mainsail, uh, making us able to sail quicker. So that's why. All right, Benny says, I can't get my Hobie 18 in the angle for writing. The big sail dragging and the big trampoline volume of the hull stopped me from turning the boat. I'm sailing single-handed. Yeah, so with the more voluminous boats, um, it is more difficult to get the boat to come round into the wind. What I found really helps, because sinking the bow, if it's not really windy, sometimes doesn't do it. So I don't need to draw a picture for this. So get to the bow of the boat and then actually climb into the water, hold on to the front of the boat and you dragging the bow with your body weight 
can actually be enough to get the boat to swing round into wind. It's like your body weight becomes like a sea anchor that cha that turns the boat like that. All right. Uh, so Leo, it, who asked the questions, is actually on board and he says great answers. Thanks. All right. You're very welcome. It is a pleasure. All right. So we have got I'm trying to pronounce the name here. Merge. Mergin. Merit. Merin. Is it Merin? Sorry about that. Uh, from the Netherlands. I'm a noob and just starting on a Hobie 14. From 1978, it's a turbo. How many, from how many knots you put the jib down or up? Oh, right. So in how much wind would you sail with the jib? I would be sailing with the jib. I'd say if you've got a jib on your 14, you should be using it until the wind is up to about 15 knots if you want to not take it so you have less power. Um, by having the jib on the boat, it makes the boat so much easier for tacking and getting going. If you don't have the jib, the 14 can be a bit of a pain to get to tack and if it stalls to get it going forwards again. But in the lighter wind, um, definitely the jib. And then if you've got a furler for the jib, it's worth always having it on the boat. And then if you're finding it is getting a bit much, then just roll that bad boy up. I hope that helps. But good luck with the 14. Um, I think you're going to have an absolutely great time. All right, we've got Sunset Wingman on board. Nice to have you with us, as always. Uh, the Hobie 18 needs about 300 pounds to write it, which would be 150 kilos. Quick math, sir. Is it? No, it's not. Let's, uh, 136 kilograms. Um, if you're standing on the hull, if you can get onto the centerboard, that will help a bit too. Which would mean if you are sailing solo and you cap dies, well worth taking a writing bag with you. And then what you could actually do is the writing bag, you could get that towards the bow of the boat, filled with water, acting like a sanker. And then when the boat has turned enough, you then get the bag from that position and put it on your back, bring the boat upright. Nice. Right, we got Gaz Gazer on board. H hope all good, loving the new videos. Great, glad that you're enjoying it. I'm enjoying putting these bad boys together. Um, yeah, there's not as much kind of focused content at the moment as I would like to be doing. It's just that the time is a little bit thin at the moment for going into taking deep dives into a few topics like the tethering video, uh, which has been a long time coming. I am, it's at the top of my list of videos to make, how to attach yourself to the boat. So if you're sailing solo or sailing offshore and you fall in the water, the boat isn't going to just leave you behind. Um, yeah, Leo says, regarding the telltales at the windward side, the mast will make vortices at the windward side. Ah, interesting. So a bit of neck there. All right. So next one in the preloaded. And um, this is actually the last preloaded question. So if you are watching and you've got a question in your back pocket that you want answering, I should get it in now. Because if there isn't, after this next preloaded question, I am going to... Um, call it a day. But in fact, at this point of the session, we're going to take a short commercial break for everyone watching later. Lovely. Um, if you're interested in supporting Joyrider TV, and one of the things that has kept the videos coming, and especially the Q&A coming, is your support, which has um, 
It's financial support that we are looking at. And many ways that you could do it. One is through Patreon. Uh, there's a link in the description. One is through channel memberships. And another one where you get something um, physical that you could hold in your hand is by visiting totaljoyrider.com and picking up a T-shirt or a hoodie or a hat. I've got a hat here. Um, it's a little bit dirty, but the hats are super cool and it's important to keep the sun off your head. If you want to get hold of a beta like this, I've only got these actually in Greece. So if, for example, you're in the USA, but you want one, the postage is going to be a little bit steeper than the online store where the garments are actually printed in your country. Very convenient. Um, I'll be posting any beaters from Greece. If you want one of these, not on the website, just send me an email and um, I'll get that to you. Very nice. Okay. So next, let's go back to the live chat. We've got I Love Windex on board. Nice to have you with us. Have you got the chance to try out foiling? Not yet on the catamaran, unfortunately. I would absolutely love to. And I know that at the end of this season, when I retire from my day job, I'll have more time uh, to seek out somebody with a foiling boat and go and visit them and uh, have a go makes big videos. All right, next one, Carl T. Can the Hobie 17 disassemble for transport? Answer, yes. Would you want to? Probably not because the Hobie 17 is a little bit, it, it takes a little bit of time to put it back together. But with any catamarans um, up to a width of around 250 width, which the Hobie 17 comes into, you can just put them, apologies if this is uh, old knowledge. This is a road trailer as viewed from the back. You'd probably have a box on there where you put your sails. And then you'd have hull supports that come to the side like this. So the more common way to transport a Hobie 17 or similar would be on the trailer like this. Then the mast would be down. And one end of the mast would sit in what we call a mast crutch at the front of the trailer. The other end of the mast would be strapped to the back beam of the boat. There we go. All right. So, oh, we've uh, had a bit of a flurry in the live chat. Rob T, nice to have you with us, Rob. Hobie 16 jib battens are hitting halfway through the mast. Should the mast be raked back further? Um, not specifically because of the jib battens. Um, if you did rake the rig back further, then perhaps the jib would hit the mast more evenly throughout the length. But um, we want to determine the mast rake by how much tension we're getting into the leech of the mainsail. We want to be able to get it block to block, but when we pull the last bit, it needs to be extremely tight to get that last bit of main sheet in. So we're getting loads of tension into the leech of the sail. And then as the wind increases, we'll let off the rig tension so the mast will drop back a little bit more. Um, all right, Justin on board says, I bought sweaters and all the stuff washed off oh dear i shouldn't be saying i shouldn't should have read it all right but um yeah all the print washed off after three is this being improved upon well apologies for that justin um yeah i'm i've got t-shirts from the same printer and they've been fine for a, a 
couple of years. So I think you must have just got unlucky, unfortunately, with the prints. What I would say with any of the printed stuff, turn it inside out before you wash it and um, hang it up inside out as well. That's going to help. But um, I think the printer is the big, the biggest printer of uh, T-shirts and jumpers and stuff globally. So they are constantly improving their technology. So hopefully uh, what you had was from a while ago. So again, apologies for that. All right. Cole is on board, says, I like to see the monoholes in the new video. Didn't realize you guys had such a big fleet. Yeah. Um, because perhaps what you, what that video didn't say, which maybe it should have done was how many of each type of boat we've got. Uh, so in total, We've got about, I think, 68 boats on the Wildwind Beach. Uh, Cole continues, have you sailed the fever? And if so, was it a good single-handed boat for someone wanting a simple boat with more sails? I could, yes, I have sailed the fever. And it is quite surprising how much fun it is. Um, yeah. Absolutely brilliant as a single hander for a single adult or if or younger person, even uh, just perhaps with less wind. It is so much fun when you've got the spinnaker up single handed, you're hiking out and planing. It planes like a fiberglass boat. So good. I would say, yes, it is a good choice. All right. Sunset Wingman says, I'm going to extend the mast and make a new oversized sail on a Prindle 19 for light air. Great stuff. For fun, take a guess at how many feet I can get on the mast before it's impossible to control or just breaks. Well, um, yeah, so I would guess that on a Prindle 19, your mast is going to be, what would it be? Um, 10, 10 or 11 meters long, 10 meters long to start with. All right, so you're going 30 feet. So, hold on. Which is 9.45 meters. All right, okay, so it's a little bit shorter than I thought, but um, wow. So is that that you've got the mast 30 feet and you broke it or is that what it is to start with? Yeah. So I would say you could put another meter. It's just that top part of the sail, top part of the ma mast, which is the bit you're extending, is going to be quite unsupported. So you would definitely not want to have too much of a top batten. If you went for a massive long top batten square top style, I think what you could do is like on something like a 49er, you could put a second set of spreaders um, and have some upper shrouds that go all the way to the top of the mast for more support. Uh, that could do it. All right, we got Declan on board, who was just here last week, who you would have seen in that C2 sending it video. Great stuff. Glad to catch the live chat this week. Great to have you with us, Declan. All right. So Sunset Wingman says I have an extra broken one. <laughs> nice. All right. So last preloaded question. This one is from Pierre, who says when raising the mainsail on a tiger, the left side of my mast is getting scratched by the head plate and the hook i do like recommended which hook on one side and halyard rope on the opposite side oh you do like it is recommended yeah so unfortunately this can be just a um something that happens because of the design of the hook on the tiger sail where at the head of the sail,
you've got a head plate which has got a whole lot of nuts and bolts holding it in and that head plate if we look at the mast from behind there's the track when we put the sail into the into the mast the head plate would go on one side this is kind of 3d i hope you're with me here and then on the other side you would have the halyard like that with a figure of eight knot going through there and yes it is going to rub up the side of the mast what i would suggest if when choosing which side of the mast to put the rope through i would put it through so that it's the heads of the bolts which are on the inside so your the bit of the this plate which is going to rub on the mast track have that so it's the heads of the bolts and not the um the other ends of the bolts because the other ends the bottom of the bolts is going to be much more scratchy um sh sharper than the heads of the bolts so that is what i would suggest there and it's always good to get into the habit of doing it exactly the same every time uh with our boats on the beach here we always put the knot on the left side um just so that we're always doing it exactly the same all right declan says this is a good comment uh, he when he was in uh, at wild wind vasiliki last week it was a fantastic experience to spend the week in vasiliki i highly recommend it. yes and um yeah declan really did send it on a variety of different boats and i think um the champagne was definitely flowing last week as it has been this week as well all right so there we go that is all we've got time for today thanks to everybody for tuning in oh um that was the end of the video but we've now got another question coming from declan who says in your high speed sailing video you were staying quite far back on the boat was this about controlling the boat in the high wind yeah so staying back on the boat when you're going for the high speed it's because you're going off the wind so when you're going on a more downwind point of sail can we illustrate this nicely so wind coming from the top of the boards. And in fact, there's a, um, a question that had been raised. I can't remember the guy's name who raised it, but it was on one of the Facebook Hope groups who was um, the question was about um, pitch polling going upwind and i put in the comment if you pitch pole going upwind it's because you're not actually going upwind um now the reason for this and for what you get to the back of the boat this is all in one if the wind is coming from here the reason that you won't pitch pole going upwind unless you really slam the boat in you've come down a strange wave and you just slam your bows into the back of the next wave then maybe you'll flip it forwards going upwind but on this upwind course the reason why you won't pitch pole is because all of the force is pushing the bows upwards if you imagine we've got the rig here the hulls the wind is blowing it all backwards if you can see how that would be there everything is being blown backwards so that is why if you pitch pole you're not going upwind um that's why when you're going upwind if it's really strong you need to get really far forwards just to keep the bows of the boat down sometimes um there we are
as we get on to more of a beam reach, then we are we don't have the wind keeping the bows up and we're loading this whole leeward hull up with pressure because as you can see with the wind here that leeward hull is really taking that side on force full full blown kind of thing and um yeah so when we're getting onto the beam reach heavy wind we need to be further back what we're trying to do is keep the boat pretty flat so that the bow's not down and the bow's not up. But the reason that sometimes it's preferential to have the bow up a little bit is because when that gust hits, the bow's going to come down and you might not be quick enough to adjust your weight. So it's better just to have that little bit of margin at the bow so that when you get the gust, you, it's not going to go straight under immediately. There we go. And then on the broad reach like this, if we're doing a speed run on the broad reach and we're right at the back, then we've got the opposite of what's happening here because the true wind is really pushing from behind, which is pushing the bows down. So we're getting to the back of the boat to lever that bow upwards and that's that's why so yes we're going to get to the back when we're going for speed because when we're going for speed we're going to be going down here down the mine shaft there we go all right so thanks very much for coming thanks very much for coming i'll see you next week with some more of this uh 16th of july for speed week um yeah so Merin, if that's how I, I'm hoping that's how I pronounce your name. Um, which course is the fastest? This course, the broad reach. But start off on a beam reach. When you get a gust, hull lifts, take it more down with the hull in the air. Boom. Um, in fact, I might have a video doing that, uh, but I just taped this afternoon with uh, Swiss Michael. We went very quickly. All right. Cheers, guys. Uh, stay safe out there. Give it the beans. Get on the speed stick if you're not already on there. Thanks.